The reactions of ether is what we're going to discuss in this lesson, and it's not going to be the longest lesson in the world because there's really not that many reactions for ethers. Now, we'll talk about crown ethers for just a little bit, and then we'll talk about the one major reaction ethers undergo, and that's the acidic cleavage of ethers. Now, this lesson is part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year, so if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so let's talk about these crown ethers for a minute. Now, these are big poly ethers. They're cyclic in nature. Uh, and, and basically, they look like crowns in the way they solvate uh, alkali metal cations. So, and the bigger they get, the larger the cation they uh, will solvate. So if we take a look at the smallest one here, so with four oxygens, and in this case, notice it's got two carbons for every oxygen. And so as a result, it's got eight carbons, four oxygens, and the way these are named... So as you give the total number of atoms in the entire ring structure, so that's eight carbons, four oxygens, that's 12 atoms total, and then crown, so, and then the number of oxygens. So this is 12 crown four, and 12 crown four is the perfect size to solvate lithium ions. So if we move up to the next size here, so to uh, solvate sodium ions, you need to get a little bit bigger, so we need to add one more oxygen, and adding one more oxygen is going to add two more carbons, and so in this case, this is going to be 15 crown five. So it's got 15 total atoms. That's five oxygens, 10 carbons, and obviously then the five oxygens. So 15 crown five. And then finally, the largest one we're going to take a look at here. So in this case, uh, you want to solve eight potassium. You got to get a little bigger yet. And so now we've got six oxygen atoms. And that means we're going to have 12 carbons or 18 atoms total. And so name's going to be 18 crown six. Cool. Now, the big thing here is that they solvate these alkali metal cations, and that's going to be helpful to us in a certain context. And so let me give you an example of where one of these might be handy. So let's say we've got the reaction, and we want to do SN2 here. So let's say we want to do SN2 here. We want to replace the bromide on a primary halide here, primary bromide with a fluoride. So, and the problem is, is that this alkyl bromide is not the most polar thing in the world. And so in all likelihood, we're going to be using a fairly uh, low in polarity solvent for this reaction. And the problem is, is that fluoride uh, and the fluoride salts you need are fairly, uh, you know, being ionic, uh, aren't going to be the most soluble in low polarity solvents. And so we've got to make them soluble. And so what we'll do is we'll use potassium fluoride here. And again, the problem is potassium fluoride is not going to be soluble in, in any of these low polarity organic solvents we're likely to use unless we add a crown ether to solvate the potassium. And if we pull the potassium away and solvate it, forming all these lovely ion dipole interactions, so it's much more likely to dissolve now and leave the fluoride as a naked anion, we say, so but which is a very strong nucleophile. And so uh, if it's potassium here, we can need to use 18 crown six as our crown ether. Had this been a lithium salt, we would have needed to use 12 crown four. Had it been a sodium salt, we would have needed to use 15 crown five. But again, being a potassium salt, we needed to use 18 crown six. So that is the utility of crown ethers. All right, so now we'll talk about the acid cleavage of ethers. And Again, ethers make great solvents because they don't really do much for, uh, you know, reactions. And uh, the one exception here is the acid cleavage of ethers. If you put them in a strong acid like HCl, HBr, or HI, they will undergo a substitution reaction. And ultimately, what you typically end up doing is breaking the carbon-oxygen bonds. And so on one side, we'd end up with these three carbons. And instead of that carbon oxygen bond, you're now bonded to the halogen of your acid. If you use HCl, that's a chlorine, HBr, a bromine, HI, an iodine. Same thing on the other side. You've got this two carbon chain on that side. And once again, instead of being bonded to the oxygen of the ether, you end up bonded to the corresponding halogen of your acid once again, and you end up with two alkyl halides. And so with excess, you need two equivalents here. So you get two alkyl bromides here with HBr. Now, the way this actually works is first thing you're going to do is protonate your ether. So let's kind of take a look at the mechanism here. It'll be instructive for us. Let's make that look a little prettier. All right. 
So the idea here is that just like an alcohol, so an OH is a bad leaving group. Well, the same thing here in the original ether, if this were to like up and leave from this carbon or to up and leave from this carbon, it would leave as a negative oxygen, which is a strong base. And a strong base, again, is evidence that is not gonna be a good leaving group. However, if you protonate it now, if it leaves from the carbon on the left or leaves from the carbon on the right, it would leave as a neutral oxygen, just like we protonated OHs to make them water, which was neutral. Now we protonate them because it would leave as an alcohol. And typically the way it works, which uh, this, the mechanism here uh, prefers SN1 over SN2 when possible. So if the adjacent carbon to the oxygen is tertiary or secondary, it proceeds by SN1. But if it's primary or methyl, it'll go by SN2 instead, just like we saw with alcohols in these hydrohalic acids. Uh, so in this case, with this side being secondary, this side being primary, it is most likely to leave from this side first. So and being that it's secondary, it'll go by SN1, so we'll just form a carbocation. We get a carbocation, we also form some ethanol here. So cool, carbocation potentially could rearrange, but don't have to worry about it in this case. We also formed back here a bromide ion that I didn't draw in, but I will now because we're definitely gonna use him and he's just gonna come and attack our carbocation, giving us that product right there. Now we've also formed an alcohol here. So and in this case, your alcohol you're gonna protonate that OH one more time with another molecule of HBr. And technically this is a mechanism we've already seen back from the alcohol chapter. So in this case, because it's a primary alcohol, it's gonna go SN2. So, but first thing you gotta do is get a good leaving group. So we're gonna protonate the oxygen of the alcohol. And now we've got a good leaving group. And again, because this guy's primary, we can't do SN1. We're not gonna form a carbocation. Wouldn't be stable enough to form, but we can do backside attack. We can do SN2. And that's gonna get us to this product along with water. So this is generally how this acidic cleavage of ethers works. So you typically add excess of either HCl, HBr, or HI, and instead of your ether, you get two alkyl halides along with water. All right, so now we wanna take a quick look at a special case here. We've got what's called a phenyl ether. We're on one side of the oxygen, you just have a benzene ring attached right there, a phenyl group. So it's not a phenol ether, but a phenyl ether with a Y there. So, and in this case, it turns out you actually can't break this carbon oxygen bond. Now, if we didn't realize this, we might, you know, go off and predict a couple of products and be like, oh yeah, Chad told me break both car carbon oxygen bonds. And in this case, you got a benzene on one side and you got a two carbon chain on the other. And we'll just add in this case, iodines to both. And you'd think, yeah, there's my two alkyl iodides. And the problem is, is you're not gonna get this one right here at all. And the key is that on that side of the oxygen here, you've got an sp2 hybridized carbon right there. And you might remember that you can't do SN1 or SN2 on an sp2. So that's kind of the problem here. And that's why substitution actually is not gonna occur there. And you're still gonna be left over instead with phenol. So you can break this bond and ultimately make that alkyl iodide, but you can't break this bond right here because again, you can't do SN1 or SN2 on an sp2. So the carbocation that would result would not be stable, not stable enough to form, less stable than even a primary carbocation. And backside attack is completely blocked. So you can't do SN2 either. Just a reminder back from our substitution chapter. And so as a result, so you can cleave this bond after you protonate this, so, but the phenol that breaks off and leaves, you might protonate that OH, but it's never going to leave again. So you can make again the alkyl iodide on the other side, but you can't get that OH to leave in this case, you're just stuck with phenol. And so in the case of a phenyl ether, you can only react with one equivalent of your hydrohalic acid and phenol here is gonna be one of your products. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, can I ask you a favor? Would you like and share? That'll enable other students to more easily find this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you're looking for practice problems, practice final exams, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. A free trial is available.